Look, I'm going to concentrate on the conditions in Australia and how we, uh, how we respond in ways more imaginative than uh, the federal government appears to be doing. The first thing to say is that there was a change in title on this topic. When it got to the planning committee, it was to be about de-radicalisation of youth. That was the problem. And then when we spoke to, uh, in particular to Linda O'Brien, the, um, the principal of, uh, of Granville Boys High, she insisted on the inclusion of the words uh, uh, inclusion and cohesion. And you can hear already a very different, um, a very different approach, a more uh, understanding approach, a more culturally sensitive approach from the de-radicalization of youth to an emphasis upon, uh, upon um, inclusion and cohesion. And I want to move from that to talk about the, the conflicts that I've, I've observed, not only with young people, but with not so young people, in different parts of the world. And they've always had a common denominator. And the common denominator, which will be common, I suspect, to all of us in a way, was about what I call the politics of identity. It was about wherever I was, whatever the religion, whatever the ideological impasse, it was about, please take me seriously. I am a Palestinian. I want, I want my rights to self-determination, for example. So that business about being taken seriously in, every, in any context, in the home, in the classroom, on the streets, in the prospects for employment, is pretty crucial to people's sense of well-being and the dignity that's meant to be conjured from every clause in the Universal Declaration. The other thing I want to say about the, particularly the face-to-face -face exchanges with vulnerable young people, concerns the, important of, the importance of conversations. Now, almost all of us here would be conversant with the idea of conversations, and we probably take it for granted and uh, are the beneficiary of them. But in research I did years ago now, particularly with young people who got into trouble, when I reconstructed their stories and their biography, it looked to me as though they'd never had a conversation with anybody. It wasn't until they, it, it, apart from being booted up the rear, it wasn't until they got into trouble, usually with the courts, that somebody started to take them seriously. So the idea of a conversation to um, solve problems and to toss ideas around, whether it's influenced by Remy or by your friend Karl Marx, uh, was actually strange to them. And nowadays, even, even allegedly bright young people, it's very difficult, excuse me, it's very difficult to have a conversation. The idea of face-to-face -face interaction is almost being castrated by, digitally. Um, I choose those words very carefully. I want to drift into the claims that are made in Australia about the benefits of multiculturalism because that's got two strands, it seems to me, with regard to the, the, uh, the fear of radicalism. On the one hand, there's the emphasis upon uh, diversity. Every group, every language group, every ethnic group, every religious group should be free, in inverted commas, to practice their own uh, their own culture, their own values. And uh, the, the, other, the other side of that coin is the concern with um, some kind of uh, integration. And somewhere in the middle of all that, there has to be uh, what, you, what Remy called the opportunity to express anger, particularly with regard to the, the, the issue of, um, of Islamophobia. I want to illustrate that a bit more by contrasting the conditions that exist in Britain with regard to this, the fear of radicalism and the actual, uh, given the, the London bombings, the actual, uh, uh, the, the justification for that fear and the, I think, an almost total contrast with the conditions that, that are here. There are, and I realise that I am keep on referring to people of Muslim faith. But of course, uh, extremism and fundamentalisms occur right across the spectrum. 
there are fundamentalist Jews or a nuisance, there are fundamentalist Christians who vote for Donald Trump um, <laughs> and to support, uh, what's his name, um, G George, George Powell. Um, there are, there are fundamentalis the fundamental isms which are a menace intellectually, culturally, wherever you go. So if I'm, it sounds as though I'm um, focusing unduly on, um, on uh, the religion of Islam, it's only merely to give it as an example. There are two million uh, people of Muslim faith recorded in the last census in Britain, but they essentially live in three places. They live in Bradford, or they live in Birmingham, or they live in East London. And the overwhelming evidence is that they continue, their, their allegiance is to the traditions that they left behind in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So the idea of some sort of even nodding familiarity with, um, with some of the conventions of British tradition, I'm not trying to talk about John Bull or cricket or beer necessarily, uh, uh, elude them. So that the emphasis, the multicultural emphasis on diversity has allowed, um, allowed almost ghetto-like conditions in certain parts of those, of those British cities. By contrast, there's certainly evidence here that every Mohammed and Fatima in Sydney gets insulted just about every day. Um, I've certainly spoken to um, taxi drivers and I make no apology for getting a lot of my evidence from taxi drivers. You know, there was a wonderful British journalist called Alistair Cook who used to give you a letter from America and he claimed he got all his evidence from New York taxi drivers. So, no, no apology. I mean, I've talked to taxi drivers who've told me that they, of Muslim faith, they've had to move from one suburb to another in order for their wives to feel, to feel safe. So, I don't think the fear that has been engendered by the government has almost, it has, it has, it has very little basis. The uh, furor surrounding the Lindt Cafe had nothing to do with terrorism. It had to do with somebody who should have been identified as a danger to himself and others uh, many, year, many years ago. And the strange thing about that is the only people who identified um, that uh, man, uh, man, Manus, um, was a, a bikies club. The, the, the psychiatrist missed him, the AFP missed him, but when he tried to join a bikies club, they said, that guy's a nutter, we can't allow him in. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, I want to um, uh, drift into looking at the present context, which is the political context that's going on every 24 hours right at this moment, and ask ourselves what relevance it has to the uh, alleged threat of radicalization of disaffected young people. It seemed to me there are three bulwarks of the civil society that we're all the beneficiaries of, but they're slowly being eroded. The first concerns the struggle to insist on a separation of church and state. We, that was, that, I mean, the Americans seem to have forgotten that, but most of the, um, most of the civil liberties that we we take for granted occurred because of that um, struggle over centuries to insist on the separation of church and state. So the, the rise of any school that's based on, um, based on religion looks a bit odd to me. A religion of any kind, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or, 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 or Islam. It's very interesting that um, the the people who want to um, promote private schooling in this country keep on, uh, and I've seen them on the television most recently, keep on insisting on the merits, on the achievements of education systems in Finland and Norway, which only have public schools. There are no private schools. So these, guys, these people are, are, as it were, a hoist by their own petard. So that, that's one bulwark of the civil society. The other, of course, is the commitment to a vigorous public sector. And the, uh, the, um, the young people who, uh, 
who've been who are opposed as a particular threat are um, have been essentially from public schools. But here we here we have uh, the, the commitment to a, a public sector which seems to have been forgotten, even in the past 48 hours when a Prime Minister says he wants almost nothing to do with public, with public schools. This absurd division, all the while you have division and separation, there is a threat of certain people being alienated. The, the undue worship of the uh, resources poured into private schools, it's amazing. Let me give you an anecdote. I go many times a year to Cabramatta High School. There are about 40 different language groups in that wonderful school. And uh, one year I took somebody called Lachlan Harris. He was on, our, on the board of the Peace Foundation. He became the very young um, media advisor to Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. And I took Lachlan out to Cabramatta High. This is before they got any Gonski money or any other money. And it was mostly a range of Nissen huts tarted up, left over from the Second World War. And he admitted to me when he got there, when we got there, that this, this was an affront to him because he'd gone to the King's School Parramatta, where the only dilemma, the only financial dilemma when he left was where to put the third archery range. So, so you get, if you, this, the, the, the growing inequality is a time bomb that has to be uh, addressed. Just because it's worse in America than it is here means that we have no cause for complacency. At least it appears to be a possible item on the agenda of the American uh, presidential elections. At least, at least um, my hopes for President Saunders, um, I thought that would draw some applause from this audience. <laughs> at least he's, he's mentioning it as a, as a time bomb and in a way the 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 fault lines of social and economic inequality are what affects the sense of threat from the Mohammeds and Fatimas who feel that um, they've got few places to go. The third, um, so the second bulwark is this commitment to a vig vigorous public sector which we keep on losing. I mean, why, why the, the Labour Party doesn't revive their commitment to that, I'm not sure. They, they seem to be, uh, at this moment, uh, uh, encouragingly stronger on the issue of financing Gonski over 10 years and making an investment in public schools. But nobody, it's a bit like not, not being too frightened to talk about Palestine. We're almost too frightened to talk about the absurd disproportion of resources that get poured into the private sector. The third bulwark is what uh, dear Linda O'Brien, who's, who's sick, reminded me about a couple of hours ago concerned the, the nature of the curriculum in schools. It, it is predominantly a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant curriculum. There is insufficient uh, cultural diversity. There, isn't, there is insufficient sense of uh, sharing and respect for the diversity that would give the identity and dignity that I referred to earlier. There's an absurd commitment to the notion that the only form of progress in this society is for everybody to go to a university and, 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 and build up enormous debts. So the, the, so the whole system is geared to uh, a sense of competition and the successful ones go to university and the alleged unsuccessful ones don't go to university. I mean, if anything is a uh, uh, the sort of built-in cancer for a current, for a subsequent society that divisiveness is. Again, I'll drift into an anecdote. I'm actually a twin, and Britain in the 19, I won't tell you when I took, we had 11, a system called the 11 plus examination. At 11 plus, you took an exam that distinguished whether you were bright enough to go to a grammar school, not to university, about 15% passed, or whether you were a cast off and you went to what was called a secondary modern school. And I had a twin brother, and he failed the 11 plus, and I passed. And the, so I would, both of us were direct observers of the, the appalling consequences of that social divisiveness. So, the, so we keep on eroding, erode, eroding those bulwarks of the civil society. 
How do we respond to the sense of to young people who feel alienated, who might sign up with ISIS, but who will be angry about no job prospects or angry simply about having few conversations and not being taken seriously? It seemed to me there are two responses. One was the one given by the Minister for Justice, Michael Keenan, in September of last year, when they produced a considerable expense uh, the 32-pager de-radicalization kit. Um, I've never gone to bed with a kit. Um, I just, um, about that, I mean a package. I don't mean... That's not a reference to anybody's name. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a case study in this kit of a, of a young woman called Karen. I think she's called Karen. And she, the example, she gets radicalized by uh, going to listen to Black Sabbath... Johnny Rotten and the Sex Pistols and other heavy metal groups, alternative music, and left-wing politics. This is the case study produced by the government. Left-wing politics and green politics. So green, green equals dangerous forms of radicalization. And the whole, the whole tenor is to engender fear. I mean, there are 43 pieces of anti-terrorist legislation on the books. The, if they ever put them into practice, our civil liberties are seriously eroded. There's a huge mausoleum to protect us built on the shores of Lake Burley Griffin. It houses ASIO. Um, I'll give you another anecdote because some of you look as though you're enjoying the anecdotes. I was uh, in a club having a, down the coast having a beer uh, a few months ago and we were talking about the absurd God you know, there's a new God in this country. It's called security. The God of security. We've got to have 12 new submarines, eight frigates. God knows how much money spent on all sorts of arms equipment. And uh, so I sounded off in, in an uncharacteristic way. <laughs> You're out of order. You two leave the room. Um, about, about, about Asia. I said, you know, look... Um, the ones I met were as thick as two short planks. Uh, they're bored out of their mind. They spent all their lives looking at screens, hoping that somebody like Jefferson Lee would turn up on the screen. And, um, <laughs> and uh, a newcomer to the, to the people at the bar said, I'd like you to know I've just resigned after working for 10 years for ASIO. I thought, oh, God, I'll put my foot in it. But then he said, I also want you to know I agree with everything you've just said. Um, so that one response is to engender fear. The other response is what I will call the Cabramatta Granville response. Cabramatta High School, there are about 1,200 kids there. It is, uh, it is a pleasure to go there, even if the public school system is constantly derided. There is uh, huge respect among the kids. There's a great deal of cre creativity. There is a, a, sense of, a sense of a harbor in a storm because a disproportionate number of the children at that school have graduated from Villawood. One peculiar form of welcoming vulnerable young people to Australia is to put them in detention. And when they leave Villawood, uh, a large number of them finish up at this wonderful uh, high school. Granville does similar, similar, similar work. I mean, I was listening to Linda telling me today about the projects for about 15 young uh, Muslim students in Granville Boys High, where they've gone not only on outward bound trips, but have spent time with Aboriginal people, listening to, uh, hearing about the song lines, going and beginning to comprehend the the, the, um, the, the wisdom of smoking ceremonies, actually meeting with the governor, uh, being away from school for about three weeks on these projects. And um, the sort of projects that get taken for granted almost every other week in an expensive private school. And Linda insists that there are enormous benefits for taking the kids seriously, giving them time to have those conversations and those variety of experiences. You know that Shakespeare, those Shakespeare lines, and this refer this. Here I'm thinking of young people in trouble. Um, 
and the roles they might play in life. You know, from As You Like It, all the world's a stage and all the people merely players. We all have our exits, exits and our entrances and one man and one woman in their time play many parts. Well, here's the first poem. It's about enabling people to have opportunities to take risks. And it contrasts the insistence on obedience, the insistence on convention, because what occurred to me about that character's sermon well, it's all about one-dimensional control from the top down. I couldn't, I couldn't see any difference between that and the kind of barbarity uh, that had gone on in schools that have now been exposed at the Royal Commission into sexual abuse. I frankly couldn't, I couldn't see, I couldn't hear much difference. This is called the, curl of, the Call of the Wild. It might refer to you. They have cradled you in custom. They have primed you with their preaching. They have put you in a showcase through and through. They have put you in this showcase. You're a credit to their teaching, but can't you hear the wild? It's calling you. Wild means take a risk. Let us probe the silent places. Let us see what luck betides us. Let us journey to a lonely land I know. There's a whisper in the night wind. There's a star a gleam to guide us. And the wild is calling, calling. Let us go. Now the second poem is, and this is at the, the, um, the, uh, the people from Islam will, will like this one because it's from the, it's from the 14th century um, uh, poet, uh, Sufi poet. And he says, uh, beyond ideas of wrongdoing and good doing, there is a field. I'll take you there. When your soul lies down in the grass, the world is too full to talk about. In other words, the, the ideas of wrong, of the, the good and the bad. You know that usually we're presented with, you're either for me or against me. You're either a good Australian or you're not. And believe me, that's got, in, in, when that's projected, that's got such appalling power to that the, the notion of the premise that uh, Remy was uh, referring to. Let me finish up with a hero of mine who was concerned with radicalization. And the, radic and the radicalization was the commitment to fascism. But he also opposed totalitarianism and the constipation that went on in bureaucracies. Some of you uh, have suffered from that, I'm sure. It's Bertolt Brecht in a poem called The Bread of the People. And if you hear the words, you'll see why what the agenda for talking to young people is really the best about, and much more imaginative than a de-radicalization kit. So in the bread of the people, he said, justice is the bread of the people. And then he went on to say, just as daily bread is necessary, so is daily justice. It is even necessary several times a day. And he asked the question, who bakes the bread of justice? Like the other bread, it must be baked by all of the people, plentiful, wholesome, daily. So I'm going to rest my case there.